before I tell you the text that we're turning into, I just want to give you guys a brief、um, introduction as to what it is that we're talking about this morning, and that is, what does God have to say to singles? What does God have to say about singleness? So I see that some of our single guys and girls are pulling out their pens and papers, and they're ready to. They got their tape recorders out, ready to record every word that comes out, because they could use any and every help that they can get to figure out how can they solve my singleness. God, can you help me?、Um, and、uh, and as I say that, I know that society has a lot to say about what it is to be single. All right, you hear it loud and clear from family, from friends, from from the media. What does it mean to be single? What is what is the opinion people have about singleness? One school of thought is that singleness is a license to be free. It's a license of freedom. You can be free to do whatever it is that you want, hang out with whichever guy or girl you want, do whatever it is you want with them, and there's no repercussions. There's no one over your head. There's nothing you have to worry about. You're free to do what you want. Singleness says is that it, it's something that is to be envied. It's something that is to be desired. It's freedom, and so. It's like living in a dream that you love, and, and and any thought of commitment, any thought of marriage, is a disruptive nightmare to this amazing dream of being single. Right? That's one school of thought. All right. And then there's another school of thought that's actually at the opposite end of the spectrum.、And、this school of thought says that singleness is something to be ashamed about. It's something that brings about embarrassment. And Friends, family will often say, "Well, you're single." And as time goes on, and you're getting older, and you're still single, they're looking at you and saying, or asking, "What's wrong with you?" All of your friends have already gotten married, and I hear this person's pregnant, and here you are, you still are single. What's wrong? What's wrong with you? And that's often even most hurtful to people who are hearing it from loved ones, such as their friends and family. When they begin to question you and ask you what is wrong, and as they continue to to press and prod, you're, you're you're wondering about what God thinks of you. Is something wrong with me? Am I am I flawed? Am I messed up? Did God screw up with me? That I'm still single even now at age what it, whatever the age is. These questions linger, and these are two contrasting schools of thoughts. One says singleness is to be envied by all means, guard it like a prize. And the other school of thought says singleness is a shame. You should be embarrassed if you're not married and have children by a certain age. And I want to tell you first and foremost, what God has to say about singleness is not in line with that. God's message to singles does not correspond to what you just heard me say. It's completely different, and it's completely foreign to that. And I really want to encourage you, those of you who are single, to understand this: is as long as you turn on that radio, as long as you turn on that television, as long as you listen to everything everyone says to you about your singleness, the more and more likely you are to succumb to what they're telling you. What God has to tell you, it's in His book, it's in His Holy Spirit. But if you're not listening, if you're not reading, then you're not taking in what He has to say to you about your singleness. And so, more than likely, you're going to become more and more susceptible to feeling what society is trying to tell you. So, I want to encourage you to do as much as you can to listen to what God has to say. This morning, I'm going to talk about singleness, probably through a passage you've not heard it tied into before. I'm going to talk to you about a person who was once married, but yet felt the tragic loss of of her husband dying. And so she tur- she basically tasted what it was to be single a second time. This is a book that's familiar with you because we've gone through it here recently. So I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to the book of Ruth. We're going to take a look at the life of Ruth, Ruth chapter one. As you guys are turning there, or as you guys are opening up your smartphones and doing that Bible app, whatever,、um, you guys,、um, I'm going to remind you real quick that. Ruth is a Moabite woman. She was married into a Jewish family, and by marriage, she marries one of the Jewish sons. And ultimately, he tragically dies for some unknown reason. So,、um, she, along with her sister-in-law and along with her mother-in-law, 
find themselves to be widows. So Naomi, the mother-in-law, determines to go back to her native land, Israel, Bethlehem, and she, uh, uh, sorry, Orpah and Ruth tag along. Now we're going to read upon a portion of the text where as they're walking along, Naomi essentially turns around and he, she looks at her daughters, daughters-in-law and tells them, you guys are free. You guys have no obligation to me or this family anymore. You guys are free to go back to Moab. You are free to go back to your country, back to your home, and start afresh again. Start a new life again. Be married, have kids, enjoy your life. That's the portion we're about to read. And let's turn to verse, verse 11. I'll read it here. So again, Ruth chapter 1, verse 11. Then Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? So at this point, when Ruth, or sorry, when Naomi tells these girls to go back, they're beginning to cry, and they're wanting to embrace Naomi all the more. And it's at this point that she says, Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? In those couple of verses, I just want you to pay attention to how many times Naomi uses the word husband and sons. She's trying to get this understanding across to to Ruth and Norpa to help them understand, look, consider your situation. You are single ladies. Your situation is that you have to get married. You have to have children. It's what society expects of you. And in that time frame, in that part of the world, it was expected that your status as a woman was determined by your marriage and by how many kids you had. And so what she was saying was accurate. It was true. And so Naomi Naomi is telling them, look, go back. And she asks these questions. If you were to come with me, do I have any more sons to give you? to be married to. And then she goes on this hint of sarcasm and says, look, um, even if I were to get married tonight and got pregnant tonight with sons, would you stick around and wait for them to get old enough to where you can marry them? It's sarcasm. And she's basically saying to them, look, it's absurd for you to come with me a step further because by coming with me, you're essentially risking the fact that you're going to stay single for your whole life. You're risking the fact that you're not going to have kids, you're risking the fact that your family, your community is going to disown you, you're not going to be welcomed there, you're not going to attain their approval. You're risking all of this if you take another step with me to Bethlehem. And it's at this moment that they're hit with this reality. And Orpah realizes it. She kisses Naomi goodbye. But What is so strange is that when she's confronted with her situation, Ruth, and the word used is clings, clings to Naomi. Now you and I both know that at this point, Ruth knew the pain of loss. She lost her husband. She essentially knew that she would have to start all over again if she were were wanting to get married. She would have to go through all that hassle and and have to figure out how is it that I'm going to go back. But, I mean, she knew that she would have to eventually if she were to get married, settle down, and have kids. She knew that it was what her family expected of her to do. It was what her family would approve of if she would just come back and get remarried. But yet she turns all of that down, and she clings, clings to Naomi. We begin to see the under, basically what we see underneath the skin, that conviction, we get to see it on the surface with that image of her clinging to Naomi. And I want to just throw out this to you. The word cling in the Greek is, uh, one second, I want to make sure I pronounce it correct, is davake. The word cling in the Greek is davake. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that is the same word God uses to describe the union between a man and and a woman, is that they will cling to each other, become one flesh, cling, that word davake, become one flesh. And that's how we described marriage. That's how we described that union between man and woman. I find it interesting that that's the same word that is used here 
in the Greek in Ruth chapter one is that Ruth knows that her situation is such that she may not ever get married again, but she intends to cling not to that, that whole understanding, but she intends to cling to God. She intends to cling to the things of God, to make God beyond and beyond everything else that the community wants her to do. For her, somewhere along the way of knowing Naomi and the family, her first love has become God. I don't know when, I don't know how, but somewhere along the way, her first love has become God. It's not become family. It's not become the idea of becoming married and having kids. All of that didn't compare. She clung to what she loved the most. And with the same intensity that someone would bring into the marriage, she brought that same intensity in her clinging to Naomi, clinging to God, to Vake. Vake. And Ruth knew that Naomi was her only connection to God. And so if she were to leave, she would no longer have that connection. And so we see her embrace, we see her clinging, and we get this understanding of her wanting to follow God and the things of God as he, she clings to Naomi. Read with me the following verse. She tells Naomi this, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. It's amazingly strong words from a girl as she stares her mother-in-law in the eye and says these things. And we get a picture, just a glimpse, of this conviction that she has, that she is not going to go back to the things of the world, but she's going to cling to God from here on out. One of the most basic principles that we have to understand about being a follower of Jesus is this. We love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul. That is the single most basic principle, commandment that we live by. Jesus was the one who said it. This is the first and most important commandment, is that you learn to love God with your entire being. This conviction is what separates Ruth from Orpah. It's what separates Joseph from his brothers. It's what separates Daniel from the other teenage boys. This conviction of loving God with their entire being. Purpose provides us an understanding of what something is, and, what, and the attention it brings to its creator. Purpose is something that we understand about something, of how it functions and the attention it brings to its creator. For example, this microphone that I'm using right now this morning, you know, its function is to project sound across these speakers. And that's its function. It's not here to make ice cream, it's not here to make pizza or project the football images on TV. Although some of you might wish it did, it doesn't do that right now. All it does is it projects sound. I can't expect it to do anything else. That's its purpose. That's the, the intent of its design is to project sound. And so when you're coming in and you're, you're, you're somebody who are, is really into sound and if you're interested in trying to figure out what's a good microphone, you listen to this and, and the way that this thing performs, you pay attention to it. And if you like it, you're going to come in and try to find out the brand of this microphone. You're going to try to find out who makes this microphone so that you can inquire more about buying it. And in a nutshell, that's what it is with us, is that if we understand that our purpose is to live for God and to love Him with our entire being, the more, people be the more we begin to fulfill that purpose and then we understand that there's nothing else that we're created for. We're not here to, to, to focus on getting married. We're not here to focus on anything else but living for God, loving Him, then that's what people begin to see come out of us. The way we treat people at work, the way we respond to adversity, the way we treat our spouses in marriage, if all of that flowed from that singular conviction of loving God beyond and be above everything else, then people start to notice. And the hope is, is that as people who are struggling and hurting in areas, they notice how you respond, they come to you and they want to know I mean, I see how you, you respond, but I want to know a little bit more about why. I mean, 
How did you, did you take a class? Did you read a book? I mean, how did you come to be the person that you are and that you, do you respond to this situation this way? Because I struggle and I need help. And then that's the open door where you begin to tell them about the gospel. You begin to tell them about Jesus. I want you to understand, as a single person, your first and foremost responsibility is to understand that you created to love God with your entire being. And the problem with us today is that Satan uses our singleness against that purpose. You hear me? Satan uses our singleness against our purpose. It begins to bring up these thoughts and these these feelings. Oh, I'm 26, 27 right now, and I'm still not married. I'm still not in a relationship. Oh, God, help me. And you you begin to develop these thoughts about my flaws, I'm messed up. And you begin to think a lot about relationships, prospects, marriage, matrimonial websites. You're, you're looking to, to figure out what you need to do to get yourself hitched or married, whatever. Probably hitched wasn't a good word, but anyway, married. Um, and Satan brings up these images and these thoughts, and it becomes something that we're obsessed about. We waste so much time thinking about things, worrying about things, that we begin to get distracted from this purpose of loving God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. It distracts us. And for those of us who are married in this room today, I want you to honestly ask yourself, when you were in that phase of being single, how many hours, weeks, months did you waste obsessing about your singleness, obsessing about your future a, a, a marriage, how much time did you waste? And write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me because I'm writing a book. So I wanted to, I wanted to, just, yeah, anyway. Um, for me personally, I was halfway through my undergrad at UT and people around me were starting to get married. Initially, I'm happy for them, praise God. But as years were getting, passing by and as I was getting older, my friends, my close friends, my roommates were in the process of getting married, and I had nothing going on. There was nothing whatsoever about me in a relationship or getting married, and, and my be- one of my best friends got married as, before I even graduated, I believe, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And I began to worry. I began to get afraid and anxious and obsessed about this whole idea of marriage, and then all of a sudden, I'm looking up shoddy.com like crazy, Never got an account, but man, I was looking to see what was out there, and you know, I don't know, I was desperate. And then I ended up, you know, in relation, talking to girls, you know, that awkward thing where you're like, oh, is there some magical spark going on here? Is she the one? Oh, God, help me, God. And then you start to begin, your mind goes all sorts of different ways that way. And then uh, as you get older, your parents get more involved, and they're looking to see, look, you're like 26 and you're still not married. And then that's another added pressure. So all of this builds up, and you're obsessed. You're worried. You're afraid. I met my wife in August of 2005, all right? Looking back, I probably wasted significant chunks of seven years of my life worrying, obsessing about marriage and about singleness. That's seven years of my life that I worried about things that I, that nothing of that helped me in August of 2005. Seven years. I want to encourage you guys who are single today. I want to spare you the pain and the misery of what I had to go through or maybe other folks had to go through. And I just want to simply tell you, just embrace the purpose that God created you for. Embrace the reality that that's your conviction, that's who you are, and that's what you're about, is that you love God with your entire heart, being, and soul. Don't do it. I mean, don't think of yourself as, as being created to get married or being created to be a dad or mom. That's not what you're created for. You're created primarily for the purpose of loving God. Be about that. Focus on that, all right? And I love how Ruth, I mean, she knew that the reality was is that she could remain single for the rest of her life, but she knew that she wasn't created to be married. She knew that she was created to love and honor God. And so she refused to go back to Moab, and she, she clings to Naomi, And she says these words, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Uh, Moving on to Ruth chapter 2. Just reading, I'm going to read verse verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. 
So throughout the story of Ruth, it's only four chapters long, there is no hint of regret in Ruth's actions. Ruth never for one moment, is there any sign of it showing us that she regrets her decision to follow Naomi, follow God. She's not thinking, oh my goodness, I should be married, I should be getting back to, to Moab. None of that goes on. And we get this amazing picture of her just getting up one day and telling herself, look, I'm just going to go to the field because we're, if we don't have any food, let me go get us some food, let me gather some grain. And the next thing I want you singles and to understand is that one, you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Number two, you live in the moment. You stay in the moment, all right? So she realizes that she and Naomi need something to eat, and so she goes out, and she begins to go to a certain field of a relative, and she literally just, on her hands and knees, she's gathering grain that has fallen on the ground when, from other people who have tried to gather the stalks. There's grain that's on the ground, and she's just literally just going through the grass, sifting through, and putting grain in her little bucket. And so the reason I bring this up is I want you to get that image, all right? Here we have Ruth, a Moabite woman who, under the scorching heat of the Middle Eastern sun, is working her tail off gathering grain so she and her mother-in-law could have some food to eat. And I wonder in my mind, what are the thoughts that are going through her brain right now? as she is getting hot and sweaty and dirty and her body is aching from the heat and the pain of bending down, is in her mind, is she going back to Moab? In her mind, is there even a hint of regret wondering what it would be like right now if I had gone back? If I had gone back, wouldn't I have gotten married by now? Wouldn't I have gotten the, the, the glory and the respect of my family by now if I just went back? My parents, they would approve of me. My siblings would approve of me if I just went back. I could bask in the glory of being a mom. I wonder what Orpah is going through. You know, I wonder in, the, in my mind is, is if Ruth is thinking about Orpah. Is, is she getting married? Is she having fun? But here I am just simply putting my hands into the dirt of this foreign land like a dog. I'm just trying to gather some grain and put it into my bucket. And not to mention the other Israelite men who notice her being a Moabite woman, the taunting and the ridiculing that she's having to go through, literally even being spit upon for being a foreigner in their land. What is Ruth thinking about? If she thought about those things, it didn't last long. In verse 7 we read that the overseer tells Boaz she's been working all morning long except for just a small break. Ruth lives in the moment. She stays in the moment. She knows that she might have had it better in Moab, and she knows that right now she's in a painful situation, a humiliating situation, and her future is not promising. All right? Yet she stays in the moment. She embraces where God has placed her. Jesus once said, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The problem that singles encounter is that they start off with the resolve to live and love God, but as years go by, as time goes by, loving God becomes much more of a chore because their situation hasn't changed. They're still single. They're still struggling to find people. They're still unsure about the reality of them ever getting married. And so they, they don't know what's going to happen. And this is something I wish I had heard 10 years ago, is that I wish somebody would tell me, just stay in your moment. Embrace the moment that God has placed you in. What I want you to understand is if you're single right now, God has a purpose for where you're at. God's purpose is not limited to you realizing it when you're married, or realizing it when you're a father, or realizing it when you get that well-paying job. God's purpose isn't accomplished when you attain those things. God's purpose is being accomplished today. And where you're at right now may not be where you're at a year from now or even five years from now. The people you're involved with right now, you may never speak to them a year or five years from now. So why has God placed you where you're at right now? Your job, your school, there's a reason and a purpose and only you and God, God knows that. And it's up to you to embrace where he's got you. All right, so it's up to you to embrace that. Back when I was single, I took two months to go on a missions trip. 
I'm 33 now, I have a, I'm, I'm married and I have a 15 month old. For me to think about taking two months off is foreign to me, all right? But instead of that, I get to enjoy raising my little baby girl, which is, she's pretty cool, she's pretty amazing. And so what I'm trying to say is God has you at different places for different reasons, and you need to live in the moment God has placed you in. Rather than obsessing about, oh, I've got to get here, then I'll make it before God. No, God's got you where you're at for a reason right now. Embrace it. Even if it seems discouraging, even if it seems like you're alone, I mean, Ruth felt it too, yet she embraced where she was at, and she fulfilled God's purpose. I love how towards the end of Ruth chapter 2, Boaz takes notice of Ruth. And he begins to bless her and tells her, look, you don't need to go to any other field. Just stay in this field. You will be protected. You will be well provided for. And what I want you to understand as singles is this, is that as you learn to live for God and his will as a single, God is essentially taking notice and he's telling you, just stay within the field of my will. Just stay in the field of my will for you. I will protect you. I will provide for you. I will fulfill the promises I have for you as long as you follow me and stay within the field of my will. God takes notice. And the story uh, continues on in Ruth chapter 3. I'm not going to read any text, but I want to talk to you about some things that Naomi tells Ruth to do for her to get married to Boaz. All right? And I'm, I'm going to talk to you through steps. All right? These are the steps that Naomi tells Ruth to do in order for her to get married to Boaz. Step number one. Wash and put on perfume. It's logical. Do we want to get, you know, meet someone and smell like B.O.? It's not good. Number two, get dressed in your best clothes. Yeah, sounds good too. Number three, go to the threshing floor. Now, for those of you that don't know, don't know threshing floor is where the, the wheat is gathered and they're basically separating the, the wheat from the chaff. It's not the ideal location of a first date, um, but we can work with it. It's fine. Step three is go to the threshing floor. Step four, don't let Boaz know where you're at, but just kind of stalk him, but kind of from a distance. And when he lies down, you just, just go to his feet. Um, okay, this is odd. I don't know of any book that I've read on about dating or, or you know, getting courtship or whatever that tells me that I'm supposed to stalk my future spouse, that I'm supposed to notice where she lies and go to her feet. That seems kind of odd and strange. It's weird. But not just that. Step number five, after he has lied down, go to his feet and uncover it and simply lay down at his feet. Okay. So not only am I supposed to stalk him, I'm supposed to go to his feet, I'm supposed to uncover his feet, and I'm supposed to lay at his feet. So here I am smelling his stinky feet, waiting for him to wake up. Is this the way? I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have tried doing that, Perhaps that's why you're still single, but, but I, want you to, I want you to know that this is weird, all right? Mo Ruth is a Moabite woman, and I'm wondering if she's leaving Naomi's conversation, and she's scratching her head, did I get that right? I mean, is that really the way I'm supposed to go about meeting my future husband? Doing these weird things? It's a bizarre set of instructions, and I really believe what God is trying to communicate to us is this, is that, you know, the important thing is, is that God is in control. God sets up the plan, God sets up, sets up the details, and he is ultimately in control. And he will work through bizarre ways to bring a husband and a wife together. All he's looking for is a, is a faithful person who will listen to him, follow him, and obey him no matter how bizarre and weird the situation is. No matter how seemingly impossible it is that this could work out, God is looking for someone who would trust him and understand and realize that he is in control and that he's got a plan, all right? And I'm sure Ruth probably questioned all these instructions. She probably wondered why Boaz, he's a lot older than I am, but yet she knew that Naomi was the closest thing she had to God, so she listened and she followed and obeyed. And ultimately, we know the end of the story, Boaz marries Ruth. I want singles to understand this. Marrying someone has so much more to do with God's hand at work and bringing two people together. I'm not saying that it's simply God doing all the work, but I am saying that it's entirely his plan. It's entirely his plan. 
So just as God has planned out your life, he's written every day down in a, in a book, and he's, he knows exactly what's going on in your life, the same thing applies to your marriage. God knows when, God knows how. It's up to us just to submit and, and walk with him, follow him. And you might sit here this morning, and you're like, Jason, I screwed up so much with my life. I messed up here, I messed up there. Well, we serve a redemptive God, a God who redeems, a God who his whole mandate is the cross and the, is, is the redemption. So no matter how badly you've screwed up, as long as you repent and follow him and love him, he will lead you. He will take care of you. Seemingly unforeseeable and unexpected ways God can use. I want to share with you my story. Um, it's really weird and bizarre as well. Um, I can't share you the whole story because I don't have enough time. And we're running short, short on time. So I'm going to share you just a small snippet I wrote down. So like you guys know, for a long, long time, I had wondered about being married. I'd obsessed about my singleness and, and felt really scared about where God was taking me and what's going on with my life. And, um, and it, it's something that I wondered a lot about because it's, it's a mystery, and I'm always wanting to know the answer just as quick as I possibly can. God didn't work that way with me. It took a long time for me to figure things out. And I remember I was, it was the night of August 2nd, 2005, my parents and I shared a room in Delhi, in India. They were asleep and I was awake. And I had gotten the picture of this girl who came across uh, to me about a week, not even a week before. And, you know, I'm uncertain, I'm unsure, because, you know, the only reason I went to India to meet someone in the first place was to appease my parents. And I was tired of their nagging me, I was tired of them bugging me. So I went to India really to enjoy some good food, and, and really to go back, you know, maybe meet some people along the way, but definitely I told my parents, I will not make a decision. I'll meet who you want me to meet, but do not expect me to make a decision saying I'm going to commit, I'm going to, I'm, I'm promising, none of that's going to happen. My friends who, who left me back in America told me, do not do that. Do not make a gut reaction about getting married to somebody. It's not going to happen. So I knew that wasn't going to happen. So on August the 3rd, 2005, we landed in Kerala, I went to this girl's home. I, you know, her parents were there. It took us about 45 minutes to realize that we're supposed to ask for, for the girl, and so we're, my parents didn't realize that. So we were just simply, I was just sitting there in a room for 45 minutes, waiting to meet this girl, and yet making awkward conversation with people I don't even know. It was really weird, really, really hard. So my parents finally get the picture that they're supposed to ask for the girl. So the girl comes in, and she sits across and. Um, so, yeah, the girl is Elsa, of course. Elsa walks into the room, and uh, she sits across. And I remember thinking that she doesn't look anything like the picture that I got. She's actually beautiful. <laughs> she was beautiful, and, um, you know, and I, actually, I don't know if Roy remembers this, but Roy and Joyce, I sat with them about the week before I left to go to India, and I, I asked them for help on how to question, what kind of questions I need to ask somebody when I meet them for the first time. So, I, and I'm from a psychology background, so I had a whole battery of questions that I asked. So it took me about an hour of just me asking lots and lots of questions. So I came back with a, an understanding that not only was she beautiful, but she had a heart of gold. And so I realized then, you know, and seven years later, she still is beautiful and still has a heart of gold. Um, but here, what I realized was, was I was a guy who was defiant, and I said, God, I'm not going to do this. I don't know why you brought me here. I said I would never agree I told my parents a million times I would never agree to get married to somebody just on, the, on a whim like that. But yet I felt a sense of God, God's peace. And I never met anybody else. That was the first person I met, and she was the one I married. And I made that decision right then and there, which was bizarre and crazy, but yet I believe it is God's will. God works in crazy, bizarre ways to bring things about. F ten years ago, I probably would have never envisioned that happening. And I wish I could tell you all the twists and turns that took place for this to happen, but I only want to tell you that it's all God. It's all God bringing, it's, it's all God's glory. It's all for him in that he works things in weird ways. And as Ruth can testify to it, she slept at someone's feet for, for some time before she married that man. I mean, these are weird things that God calls us to do, but yet, as you walk with him, it's God's plan. It's God, that, who, it's God who's at work. So this morning, as I close, I, I, I want to remind you of some of the things that we talked about. We talked about the story of Ruth, and we understood that 
Ruth was a woman of conviction, purpose. She knew that her purpose on earth wasn't to get married, but it was to love God with her heart, her mind, her soul. We understand that Ruth was a woman that didn't freak out when things didn't go her way, but that she embraced the moment that she was living in. She was faithful to God. And number three, she ultimately trusted God and knew that he was in control and that he would work out the details of our life. Even though it was bizarre, even though it was weird, it was Ruth who trusted that God was at work, and ultimately God blessed her. This morning, I just want to just piggyback on one point as we close, and I just simply want to state this to you guys who are single, and especially even to those who are married, is understanding the purpose that you are here on this planet. It's beyond your marriage. It's beyond being a dad or mom. It's simply this, to love God with your entire being. And understanding that there are many things on this earth that are going to try to compete for that focus, that's going to compete for that purpose, but yet you have to have that resolve, that purpose, and, and just continue to fight through this purpose that you love him with your entire being. And allowing everything about your life, the way you treat yourself, the way you treat your spouse, the way you interact with people, everything that goes on from within your body, has to be out of that purpose of loving God with your entire being. And like I told you before, the purposes of God are realized. People begin to note that God is the center of your life. And like the microphone, when someone's trying to figure out, you know, how does this mic, you know, is this a good microphone? And they think it's good. And they want to find out who built it and who sold it and who makes it or whatnot. The same way, people are going to want to know who or why are you acting the way that you do and you get a chance to point them to Jesus. Uh, this morning, as we, as we close, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit. As we, we're about to get into communion, and so I want you, I want you guys just to, to bow your heads with me and, and to close your eyes as we reflect upon Jesus, and, and I want to tie him into what loving God is all about. You know, he is the one who was the perfect example of what it was for us to, to see what it means to love God with your entire being. And this morning, in a bit, as we're about to take of the bread and, and drink of the cup, we realize that for Jesus to love God with his entire being, he had to ultimately empty himself of his position and of his status to the point that he embraced a cross and ultimately he was hung and nailed on that very cross. When we consider what he did and what it means for us, we understand that loving God can mean that it means that we're going to be in difficult places. It means that we're going to be emptied. It means that we're going to probably be alone for seasons of our life. But ultimately, there's a purpose behind it. And for Jesus, that purpose was saving our lives, forgiving us, taking our place, redeeming us, redeeming the plans and the purposes he had for us, there is a purpose and a plan behind what he did. And in Philippians chapter 2, it says that there will be a day where, where not only is he exalted above everybody, but ultimately there will be a day where every knee on earth and under the earth will bow, and every tongue on the earth and under the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So this, this morning, as, you, as you're thinking about that, I want you to reflect on, on that example that he's shown us about what loving God means and what it's meant for you. And embrace that responsibility for your own life and understand what it means for you as you carry on in this life here on earth now. Let's pray. Father, we, we just love you and we thank you, God, for just the amazing example of Ruth's life, that in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of sorrow, she was a young lady who never flinched, never looked back, but she remained faithful. She remained purposeful in her conviction to, to loving you and following you with her entire heart, mind, and soul. We thank you, God, that she was a woman that embraced her moment, even though it was humiliating and it was demeaning. And she was a woman who trusted that you were in control, 
and that you always had a plan, no matter how bizarre it was. We thank you, God, that you elevated her to be Boaz's wife and ultimately in the, in the family line of Jesus. We thank you, God, for the example that we have in Christ and that how he loved the Father, loved you with his heart, mind, and soul. And ultimately, he was emptied upon to the point where he was dead on a cross to save us. And we thank you, God, for the day that's ahead of us that we'll, we will one day be worshiping and praising him as a name above every name. And for here, for us right now, I, I pray for our singles. I, I especially remember them, and I, I ask that you would remind them that they are created for the simple purpose of loving you with their being, that they are to embrace the moments that you've given them right here and right now, and that they are just simply to trust that you have a plan and that you are faithful to complete that plan. I pray for them. I pray that our, our married couples here would, would be faithful to, to look after our singles and, and, and love on them and to, and to be willing to counsel them and provide them prayer, encouragement, whatever it might be. I pray that we would work together. And ultimately, our prayer, God, as a community is that we would be a, a group of people that love you with their entire being. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We ask this all in Jesus' name.